Well, I'll go with this. Okay, so just a small disclaimer. I don't have a factor of 10 reduction in the branching ratio here, as you are waiting for. And the other thing is that I didn't jump in the discussion before because uh, <laughs> it's exactly what I'm going to talk. So if there's kind of like a proactive interaction right now, I'll be very happy about this. Uh, this is a relatively simple talk because it's kind of like, well, what I'm going to present is obviously all this thing about the resonance on Boron 11 that I presented the last year here, but I was not able to attend the the session for discussion. So I'm, I'll be ha very happy to, to take any question at this point. Also, because what we did, it's like, as, well, what we are trying to do is like an experimental program that it's connected through all the experiments that we are doing, because this is a quite challenging experiment that was done with the DPC, you'll see that. So it can, this new experiment that I'm going to present can, kind of like has a feedback effect on the previous one to explain where we could have gone wrong from the experimental point of view, but also for you from the theory point of view, right? So that's, that's the aim of this talk. So that's why it doesn't wanna go, okay. That's why I'm going to introduce again and explain carefully and also at some point I will explain details, technical details. I'm sorry if they are too technical, it's kind of like what Jerome presented right now, but I think they are important to understand what could be the problem we have here in assessing the, the branching ratio of the Berlin 11 decay, because I guess that right now there's a common consensus that this resonance exists, or I hope so, right? So I will talk about the beta decay proton emission, very 11, very quickly. And the motivation is, for, of course, again, once again, well, it was a start of, like the project to determine a possible exotic decay beyond the standard model through all the emission of those, those dark sectors. But we end up finding something else. And I'll talk about a follow up experiment we performed, completely different setup to well, figure out if what we were doing was correct or not, because this had a lot of controversy in that regard. And then I'll talk about, well, some future prospects for what other experiments that we wanna do, because I think that one has to keep measuring until we have a satisfactory answer for what we are doing and some conclusions there. One of the very nice things about this conference that I'm enjoying very much is that, well, now as a community, we are striving to go to the most exotic system ever. So I stole this cartoon from Kevin Fosset that explains very well what, well, we don't really need to go into very exotic nuclei to study extreme uh, phenomena. So we just need to look into the region of the excitation energy that is interesting. And well, this is what has been pointed out many times here in this conference, that there's a clear uh, interaction between what would be the bound and unbound part of a nucleus itself. This is like, well, this chart here, or well, this, uh, this program has been kind of self-updated right now because this was not intentional, but there will be tetra Newton talks and certain hydrogen seven talks here as a like, progress answer, let's say. But what we want to assess in this, in this work is exactly a narrow resonance that appear in one, could say a Humboldt nucleus, which is boron 11, which is a stable nucleus. So uh, I have to apologize because there was some references here, but the study of these uh, systems also revealed a lot of interesting, well, as you say, not going very far away from the value of stability, but at the same time that requires also new developments on the detectors and technology that allow us to explore exactly what we have to study. So you've seen many nice examples and I have to say that I'm biased in this regard because I like TPCs and I work on TPCs, even though what I'm presenting is not TPC, but 
you saw, for example, the very impressive result of the carbon 12 and neutron. Also, the very nice uh, plots about the proton emission that Jerome uh, saw before, uh, showed us before, and also the pioneering experiment of the proton reactivity with the optical TPC. So, well, what I'm trying to say here is that we have kind of like exotic phenomena not going very far away from stability, just as I said, looking into the detail of what we really want. So, okay, let me go into the beryllium 11 decay. So, as you, as it was mentioned before, the, the main problem or, well, one of the major problems that we have right now in nuclear physics is the, well, physics in general is what there's a discrepancy between two different methods for measuring the neutron lifetime. So you have this bottle and beam experiments and they have a difference of four sigma or 1% if you will, that has not been possible to address through many experiments. So that's still there. So uh, as always from our community, there's always a intention to address some problems that look, might look that are uh, external from what we do, but in principle, you can have some answer from the nuclear physics. And that was, this was kind of like what uh, highly hypothesized by Hornell and Greenstein about, well, the possibility of serving, of accounting for that difference in the neutron lifetime through an, an exotic decay where the neutron will undergo uh, decay into a dark sector. Uh, of course, uh, with all the experimental, uh, the, the new experimental results that we have been, I mean, through all these years since this was published, there were many things that were ruled out, especially scenarios for uh, dark particle and photon and dark particle and electron and positron and so on. There was still something to say about the possibility of observing a nuclear dark decay from a neutron halo. So in this case, what would happen is that through the decay of a very specific nucleus, we would observe, or in principle, one would observe the disappearance of the neutron into a dark sector. That's extremely challenging because, as I said before, you have to go into the uncertainty limits of 1%, which is obviously very complicated, as you know. So th this was pointed out by Hüsner and Riesegger. So as I said, in a very specific scenario where the where we have a neutron separation energy below that value that you see here, this may happen in this condition. So there are some uh, candidates here, and among them, the beryllium 11 with a very long lifetime, and you'll see why it's very long, because in our case, we have to implant and let it decay on a TPC. And as I pointed out before, this thing drift. So it's uh, the best candidate. The problem is that there's a lot of different channels open within the Q value for the beta decay, but we'll see that. So, I was saying that if you have many decay branches, including this one, maybe it's not the best. It's the best in terms of uh, neutron separation energy itself. Or yes, it's in terms of lifetime and uh, bad neutron separation yeah. energy. Too. Of course, it doesn't help to have millions of particles at the same time, that's obvious, but you don't have a choice because there's, I, I won't go into the details there, but this is by far the best. Okay, so, and the ranging ratio depends, as you can see here on the, well, there's an upper limit depending on the mass of the hypothetical dark particle mass. And this is important because, well, well, I, I'll explain that later, I think it's better. So there was, a uh, pioneering experiment performed at CERN where uh, Rizager and collaborators did the experiment just to observe this decay indirectly by implanting beryllium 11 into a copper plate. And after that, because the, uh, the residue for this decay would be obviously beryllium 10 after emitting a dark particle or a proton. So the idea would be to investigate what will be the total amount of beryllium 10 in this case. So beryllium 10 is million years lifetime. So you can take whatever you implanted there and bring it to AMS 
and extract how much content of print and there is there. Okay. And that's what they did. And they obtained a branching ratio of 8.3, 10 to the minus six. So this was a very nice experiment. So the question is that that branching ratio is huge compared to the theoretical predictions as you already saw many times. So that might be explained that if there's a resonance that uh, the building element would decay to. And in this case, it would be in bottom 11. So this is kind of giving us a hint of what's going to happen. Of course, this does not observe any proton itself, the experiment, but uh, using that information and in doing another experiment where we could observe protons, we could say something about this hypothetical dark decay. And at the same time, it's interesting to measure the protons because uh, one can extract some properties of the halo itself, in particular the BGT, which has a very well-defined value for halo neutrons that are supposed to be free to some extent. So as I said, well, any discrepancy between the indirect and the direct result will give us a lot of information regarding the, the, the exotic channel, but at the same time, measuring protons, it's important. It's very challenging because the Q value window, it's still uh, almost 100 kV, 280 kV, which means that the protons are going to have very, very low energy. And as I you saw before, if you know which particle is the one that you are going to detect, you can extract information. But the problem here compared to other cleaner reactions channels is that you need to identify it, okay? So, and this is important, even though I talk about this several times because this might be the main source of error when determining the branching ratio. Uh, the other problem is, well, as Peter pointed out the other day, Berlin 11 is quite exotic in the sense that you have all thresholds packed together within that Q window, right? And well, obviously the, he, the Berlin 11 has preference for lithium seven plus alpha, but there's also Berlin 10 plus proton, which is what we want here. The neutron threshold, it's 200 kb above the proton threshold. And you have also the tritium threshold here. Okay. So there was an experiment that was done uh, a few years ago at CERN, where, well, you can see what's the, it's very difficult to measure in the region of 200 kV by doing implant decay of beryllium 11 in silicon detectors. Although this experiment yielded a very relevant information that I explained later. So this is the decay pattern without taking into account the boron beryllium 10 plus proton channel. And as Jerome uh, showed before, when you have betas, they are uh, everything is polluted there and it's very difficult to do have identification. So that's the reason we have to do it with an active target and protection chamber. And in this case, we use one, which is different from the one you saw before because it's a cylindrical one and has a pad plane with triangles, 2000 pads, relatively modest, but this one doesn't have any silicon detector around. All the information you get, you get it from the detector and from the characteristic energy loss of the particles inside of the gas, okay? so. We did this experiment, bringing the detector to Triumph. I'm not going to give details about how we did the experiment, but you can ask me if you want. And this is what we observe. As I said before, uh, the problem is that it has a very long lifetime. So when you implant it, it drifts to the cathode of the, of the detector. So you only see one of the products of the reaction. So it's a little bit more complicated in that regard. Of course, you have a lifetime which is exponential, so you see some decays in the gas. But here, what you see by one would call calorimetry is the, well, these different channels where you have the alpha and lithium seven, or alphas coming together with excited state of lithium seven, because we have also the possibility of exciting lithium seven. And in this region here, we'll have the low energy excited lithium seven and the proton. So, what we do here, because it's obviously not clear what to do, okay? So of course, one of the things that we had to do is to have a 
calibration. So just to know how protons look like in our detector. Actually, that's the next one of the next slides. And um, well, uh, I don't know where it is, but in, we injected protons. We took the energy, the uh, energy loss curve for the protons, and we did a we constructed an objective function just to do a like common chi-square fit with all the possible combinations that we have here between protons, alphas, and lithiums that we had from the experiment itself. So we measure that and we use it for doing some particle ID. And in this case, we were very extremely, extremely lucky because the only one that looks like quite different is the proton one, but it's very difficult to distinguish lithium and alpha. And now we come into the complicated part of the analysis because as you can see here, this is what we obtained after filtering the previous plot by doing a correlation between the goodness of the feed, if you will, between lithium and seven. So these error bars are larger than these ones because as you go down in energy, this distinction or these features on the energy loss curve become more and more complicated. So it's difficult to assess. I, I'll come back to that later. In any case, we observe this decay with a branching ratio that was even higher than before. And this is, I should have like highlighted this in red because as you know, this is the point of controversy everywhere. 1.2, 10 to the minus five with 30% of our uncertainty, which means that we can forget about saying anything about the dark decay, of course, because you need 1%. And our calculations yield like uh, 8.2 10 uh, times to the minus six. And this is in agreement with what was measured with the EMS technique. And more important is that we observe a very narrow resonance of 12 keV at this energy and a width of 12 keV with two possible spin, spin, spin parities favored by the one half beam favored in this case. We introduced an uh, error in our publications because the log of t was wrongly calculated and this was pointed out in a comment. Uh, we uh, will kind of corrected that. And as you can see, we have a BGT for this particular experiment that it's above any possible limit, but still within the error bar. So I'm pretty sure that this will be at some point a good point for discussion. We also determined that the decay in the continuum would be characterized for a branching ratio that will be orders of magnitude to small. So everything was pointing to some resonance here. But as I said before, this is complicated, a very complicated experiment. And of course, we are working into an improved version of the detector to do the experiment in better conditions. But in the meantime, one has to say something. Well, in the meantime, is that theory was, of course, saying something about it. So you saw that what uh, was presented by VTEC is that, well, one of the things that it's important and we've seen during, through this conference is that, well, it's obviously that the continuum, continuum is needed for explaining many of the properties that we observed before. And it's not different in this case because, well, we know that this near threshold state resonances exist in different uh, nuclei can see here a carbon 12 would be the most famous man with the Hoyle state and well we have an example here of fluorine 15 and lithium 11 so in this case through this calculation it was observed that there is a high degree of uh, collectivity or let's say that a continuum correlation and this well as you saw it was it was pointed out that it was such little lower energy compared to what we obtained experimentally, but nonetheless, the resonance was well reproduced within the cell model and the, the continuum. But as you saw before, there's a still some uh, point that does not fit with the branching ratio that we measure, is that if you put the whole information together available on beryllium um, boron 11, uh, the branching ratio does not reconcile with the properties of the resonance itself by a factor of 40, which is quite a lot. Uh, for these calculations, it was used, as I pointed out before, one uh, possible state, a uh, three half state that was inferred from an R matrix fit in this experiment that was done by, uh, well, it was at CERN. So 
here's the first problem. Of course, there were other, uh, other type of calculations like halo effective field theory, where the resonance was predicted and also some kind of like uh, the space decay yielding a similar value that we inferred before. And this is kind of like in good agreement with uh, our results. Recently, the resonance was, of, was obtained with uh, no core cell model with continuum, with ab initio calculation. But as you can see, with a branching ratio, as I pointed several times before here, an order of, well, 10 times smaller. So, you, so even though what they argue is that this is within the experimental value because uh, the, what we say, the non resonant uh, branching ratio would be of the same order. Okay, well. The, the thing is, well, I just put this, but I'll, I'll highlight this later because it's part of the next experiment that I'm going to explain. And you also, sorry, you also saw the uh, calculations by Alexander Bolia. And well, one of the things is that as it was asked before, uh, if, if there's a alpha decay, from that experiment too, that would make things worse. And these calculations will proceed, will proceed the, the decay will proceed through the isobaric analog state with a lifetime would be similar to what one expects without the resonance itself with a relatively large spectroscopic factor of this isobaric analog state one, one half point. So things are very entangled at this point and there's no answer for neither experimental, neither theory that could put everything together. So what we decided to do is just to do the time reversal reactions, because if the, if the resonance is there, uh, it has to be populated with a simple reaction or simple quotation marks, like berlin tenon proton going to that resonance, okay? Of course, this does not address the problem of the branching ratio itself that needs a more dedicated and better experiment in that regard. But this would, first of all, will prove that the resonance is there or not with this experiment. And at the same time, we can measure possible, possible branching ratios to other decaying channels. And that's what we did. And for this case, we used a very simple setup because such a narrow resonance would be very difficult to measure with a setup like a TPC because of the properties of the TPC or well, many technical details that I'm not going to explain here. So rather than doing that, we kept it quite simple and we just put a silicon detector in front of a CH2 target, literally like that. What was the challenging point here? The challenging point was to have a beryllium 10 beam of the required energy. And this was because of the energy spread cannot be very large. So for example, in the case of the neutrons, if you have large spread, you have induced error there. Uh, what we did is we took some material from the Polsherer Institute in Switzerland and we created a source and it was reaccelerated beam with very good properties. And the beam was stuck inside the CH2 target. And literally what we did is just to measure scatter protons and something else, hopefully. We'll see. And the only thing is that it's, it, this is a the thick target method, thin thick target, if you will. And with the energy of the elastic scatter protons, you can reconstruct the whole excitation function and see if the resonance is there. So our predictions based on what we measured before were these. And this is very important for the result because as you can see, this, is, this would be the resonance effect if there's only proton uh, decay there. So it's quite large. It will be on top of the potential scattering, obviously, because it's at very low energy. And that would be the effect at 180 degrees, but at different angles. Actually, we had two detectors, but this was not working very well because we expect to have different contributions at different angles. But for the moment, we are talking about a very an isolated, hopefully resonance there in a very narrow region because we kept the energy low in the energy very low. One of the nice things is that the energy loss of the protons and possible alpha particles through the, through the target, because you have to somehow figure out what's the interaction point was kind of constant. Uh, for particle identification, we just used the 
time of flight between this detector here, which is a micro, a micro channel plate detector and the silicon detector with a very limited resolution, but this is at the same time very low energy. So they were rather slow. And this is what we obtained. So on the left, you have the time of flight. It's reversed well, for those of you who know how uh, time of flight with a PAC works. But in any case, you can see here that this part corresponds to the uh, protons. And there's a very sharp cutoff here because of the energy of the beam. This is just elastic scattering. <laughs> and at the same time, we have alphas here. But these are not the alphas that we were expecting because we have a thorium source for calibration. <coughs> and it seems that we forgot that when you put a source inside the chamber, the source stays there when you take it out because you have a sputtering and you have material there. So you can clearly see that these are the thorium uh, peaks here. And then there is this tail coming from well, we don't know yet. And then there is the excitation function for the protons. So as you can clearly see, there's a it features a interference here on the potential scattering at this energy of 171 kV is what's obtained with a very simple R matrix fit with the code Azure. Okay. But what it's important to notice here is that, as you can see, the total width, it's much smaller than what we predicted from a simple potential scattering calculation, assuming that the width of the resonance was 12 kV as inferred from the beta delay experiment. But it's not the case. So the conclusion is that there's either something wrong on the determination of the width from the beta delay experiment, or there could be a channel that it's kind of like exhausting some of the width, which would be in this case, hopefully alpha particles that we were not able to observe because we have some contaminations here. But nonetheless, from the feed, we obtain the energy of the resonance that it's almost 20 kV smaller than before. And this is important because the branching ratio on the log FT and the VGT, well, not the branching ratio, but the VGT depends very much on the energy and the width of the resonance. So the total width is compatible with what we obtained before, but the width, the partial width for the proton, it's only 4.5 according to this feed. And of course, well, I'll, I'll talk about what would happen if we don't have the alpha branching ratio but we inferred an alpha partial width of 11 kV, which is much larger. Okay, that's without the question. Okay, I'm allowed to finish anyway. So of course, one way to illustrate this, instead of doing a more complicated R matrix feed, is just doing a very simple optical potential calculation. We did one ourselves without not having a lot of expertise on that with the Sao Paulo optical potential model. And we just introduced the resonance to the imaginary part here. But this was not to figure out if the resonance was there, obviously, because we knew it. But one of the remarkable things here is that the shape of the resonance after the resonance itself is very interesting if, uh, in the sense that it stays above rather for, for a long uh, energy domain. And this is because this is a well, if you want near barrier resonance, near threshold, and the penetrabilities are changing very fast there. And that's one of the things that it's clearly reproduced here. And it was clearly reproduced with this calculation that was, um, it was published in archives some uh, like a few weeks ago where they have this self-consistent skirmy hearty fog in the continuum where with almost no normalization, they can reproduce not the width, but the energy of the resonance itself. So with this in mind, one of the things is that, okay, as I said before, there's still a problem here regarding if there's alpha particles or not. So as I said before, uh, one, one of the things that we wanna do is just to uh, redo the experiment, this exact experiment to see to, to, with better statistics, because we suffered a lot of from statistics to assess the alpha branching ratio. So if it's not there 
and all the width would go to the proton with 4.5 kV, it would be difficult to reconcile that with the experimental resolution. Also, as I pointed out before, there could be some neighboring three half plus overlapping state as inferred from this experiment I said before. And as I said, this does not solve the problem with the VGT itself, but the energy and the width of the resonance are very important for the calculations to have reliable uh, results. And at the same time, the VGT changes very much with that. So a dedicated measurement is needed. And as it was pointed out before too, this was the, the resonance itself was confirmed by a complement uh, another experiment where the by FSU with a Berlin beam doing the DN reaction, they observe the resonance, different energy. At this point, we are going into the very fine tuning for the energy. I, I, I want to remind you that. But even more important, they observe also alpha particles, as you can see here. And in my opinion, they have a relatively nice result here. They didn't go into the very detail of this, but they gave an upper limit for the alpha branch of 40%. So once again, that's what we will try to do. Well, this is obviously what I said before. This is a paper by Vitek and collaborators that I don't know if it will be published soon, but it's important to remark that there's still a problem regarding the position of the resonance and the branching ratio. And the last thing I want to do is just tell you how we did the analysis of the curve for the beta delay experiment, because it was challenging and we reanalyzed that several times because it's like, okay, people keep telling us that 10 to the minus five, it's incorrect, but with our best intention, we did several analyses, the most reliable, reliable one being this one where we put all the experimental and uh, parameterized energy loss curve for deuteron, proton, tritium, alpha, lithium, and the ones from the experiment together. And this, that was a more complete analysis than before. And we observed here that what we you observe here is the, the goodness of the fit by the chi square with respect to the energy. And you can see these are the protons, but there's some overlap here with, of course, the lithium and the alpha. And this is the part that is difficult to assess. And well, I'm not going into the detail. If anyone has any question, you can ask me, but through the ratio of chi square, you can estimate what will be the uncertainty and all the, the possible uh, systematic error that you have here, because obviously this is lithium to proton. And you can see that mm -hmm. for the lowest ones, uh, you would have more lithium than proton here. And you have to introduce some systematic uh, selection that doesn't change the branching ratio by a factor of 10. So we are preparing a paper regarding this because I think it's worth showing the community how we did this, but maybe the data had other type of problem. And the last thing I want to say is that, well, what's next? I said that we want to do the beryllium tenon proton experiment, measuring, well, focusing on the alpha, there's also the other reaction that we are going to do at Notre Dame, which is lithium on alpha, going to beryllium proton. So we want to cover all the possible reactions there. And one thing that's important is that we are searching also for the beryllium plus triton emission in beryllium 11. And this is actually one of the candidates that you can see here. So just to make things even more complicated. So as I said, they, the events decay from the cathode. So if the cathode is here, let's say, you would have one missing particle because this would be a very characteristic shape of the triton and the beryllium-8 going into two alphas. And this is compatible with the ranges of the, these particles at the energy of the resonance in the gas that we use here. And the la very last thing is, of course, we are going to measure directly again the beta delay proton emission. We're still trying to figure out if we are going to use a negative ion drift optical TPC that where you can measure recoils of 20, 30, 40 kV, if you will. So that will improve the resolution on the energy loss curve. And the other thing is that we could use also the ATTPC with the magnetic field and use the magnetic rigidity for having a better identification of the particles. Here's an example of a data and analyzing of 
uh, oxygen 16 on alpha and you can see for example the hoil state decaying and the scatter particles and the rigidity give us very well the alpha particle against this which is a proton here and this is all I wanted to say. And well, you know that there's a still a problem here in the branching ratio of the beta decay uh, of uh, beryllium 11. I think that we have a strong evidence that we have a resonance there, but still some information missing regarding the width of the channel. Thank you very much for your attention.